Good afternoon, and on behalf of Ascend and the Center for Global Brand Leadership at Columbia Business School, I want to welcome you to our conversation on diversity and inclusion and the changing values of business leadership. The events of 2020 have so sorely strained American businesses, an unprecedented global pandemic, protests over social injustice, and head-snapping changes in technology and consumer preferences have come, have come together to create a unique and challenging moment. It may be that things return next year to what passes for normal, but just as likely it will bring new challenges and new expectations. Whether it is technology or unexpected events or changing cultural norms, the only constant we now know is change. Today, we begin our, our conversation on what are the values of leadership that can help companies survive and thrive in these tumultuous times. We're not certain the answer, no one is, but we are sure that the new values of leadership are not the values of the past, and that women in more diverse leadership teams need to play a central role in articulating this new future if businesses are to prosper. The geography of change is enormously complicated. What should be the new culture of leadership? What are the barriers to progress? And how do women and people of color step forward so they can be key players in leading necessary change? These are challenging questions, but fortunately we have an extraordinary group of leaders with us today to talk this all through. Caroline Feeney is the CEO of Individual Solutions for Prudential Financial, where she leads a team of some 3,600 professional planners and advisors. Angela Lee is a professor of practice and chief innovation officer of Columbia Business School and the founder of 37 Angels, an angel investing group dedicated to closing the gender gap in startup funding. And Rick Way is the senior vice president of strategic alliances and outreach at the US Chamber of Commerce and is a person principally charged with articulating the Chamber's diversity initiatives to the American business community. At the end of our conversation, Matthew Quint of Columbia Business School will take on the challenging task of summarizing our proceedings and describing next steps. We'll want your questions starting right now. The Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, screen is live. So please uh, enter, enter your questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as time allows. But we're fortunate to be able to ground our conversation in hard data. We have details to share with you from a new poll with Morning Consult focused on the changing values of leadership and the role of women in leadership. Throughout this conversation, we'll be turning to Joanna Piacenza, the senior data editor at Morning Consult, to lay out some of, of our key findings from this poll. And we'll start the conversation with Joanna. So Joanna, what did uh, this new Ascend Morning Consult uh, poll find about the changing values of business leadership? Hi, Ken. Um, happy to be with you. Happy to be with everyone. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen so you can see uh, some details about this poll. Let's see here. All right. Um, so I've only been given three minutes to go over section one. I'm going to try to do it as quickly and um, as efficiently as possible. Um, so uh, as Ken said, I'm going to kind of be going through section by section. There are three sections we want to touch on. Um, the first is going to be about leadership. Uh, a little intro about Morning Consult for those that are unfamiliar. Uh, Morning Consult is a data intelligence company that's enabled every day, uh, gauging public attitudes on everything from election trust to favorability of SNL. We poll thousands of people on their attitudes in 12 different countries, including the US every day. Um, if people want more details about this methodology, I'll be posting the cross tabs at morningconsult.com. We're pretty transparent about all of our polling. So section one, leadership values. Um, as Ken mentioned, uh, 2020 has been a, a different year uh, for everyone. The role of chief executive is becoming a higher profile position over the last few years, and the public is applying higher levels of scrutiny on those that are kind of taking these executive positions, who they are, how they lead. So one of the first things we wanted to ask is we wanted to ask folks to select a number of characteristics that they think are important for CEOs and other executives to have. Um, and being open-minded uh, was one of the, the top traits. Here's a breakdown of the most selected by all adults and by gender. And as you can see, there's a lot of similarities here, right? Um, between the two genders, uh, we want someone who's open-minded, we want someone who's communicative, we want someone who's fair, accountable, all seems fairly reasonable. But then we ask folks whether or not they think these, uh, these traits, these different characteristics 
were more applicable um, to female leadership or male leadership? Do they associate being open-minded with a female CEO? Do they associate being profit-oriented with a male CEO? And what we found is that eight of the top 10 most cited characteristics were more closely associated with female leadership than with male leadership. So here are all the characteristics that we tested. Um, yellow here means that respondents um, associated this characteristic with female leaders more than male leaders. So as you can see, there's lots of yellow here, um, especially among the most desired characteristics. Those are the ones on the far left. So open-minded, accountable, communicative. I also wanted to see if there was any correlation between this trait desirability in our CEOs and how people gendered them. So I plotted them on this scatter plot, and this is also available at morningcoms.com if you want to just kind of stare at it after this. Um, the more to the right the dots are, the more they're desired. Um, the higher the dots are, uh, the more they're associated with female leaders, and the lower the dots are, the more they're associated with male leaders. So I kind of had two takeaways from this. So the public is roughly divided on which gender they associate key characteristics with. But if you look at the yellow dots, women strongly associate important leadership traits with female leaderships. Women want more female CEOs. And I think that's where I'm gonna end section one for some conversation. Thank you, Joanna. Um... Well, let me start off with you, Caroline Feeney. Um, you run a big company inside of even a bigger company. Um, what do you see um, about the changing characteristics of business leadership? How much of this data reflects the conversation that goes on in a C-suite in a major company like Prudential? Well, well, first of all, Ken, uh, thank you for having me. And Joanna, as always, um, tremendous insight. So thank you for that. Um, I, I do think think that we're seeing a, a gradual shift um, take place in terms of the leadership values that we talk about and the leadership qualities and attributes that, that we're looking for in leaders. At least I, I see that within Prudential as we talk about top talent and future talent. And I'm, I'm delighted that I see that. I think this is an important um, shift. And obviously, if you just think about some of the statistics that Joanna um, walked through, people are looking um, for this, for these new leadership values in their leaders of today. I don't think this is a point in time um, because we are living in 2020 with, you know, completely unexpected um, uh, challenges that we're all living through. Um, I, I think this is here to stay. And I think people are going to place ever increasing scrutiny on their leaders, how they're leading, how they expect them to conduct themselves. And so I think it's wonderful. And I think, I think it's, Terrific that many people associate these new leadership values with, with women. Um, I think that in and of itself is creating a different conversation in companies um, about um, how are we readying um, this next generation of, of women leaders to take on more senior roles in the organization, Ken. When you see, um, what is driving the change? Is it, is it different expectation from employees, from customers, from you know, the, the general culture, or, or is it a top-down demand for hey, we need to change for, for the future? Yeah, I don't know that it's like many things. I don't know that it's just one uh, thing, Ken, that's driving us. I do think it, it's customers. I do think it's employees and what they expect from their leaders. They're expecting their leaders to be more approachable. They're expecting their leaders today to not be afraid um, to show their vulnerability and be very real um, they're expecting their leaders today to show and demonstrate empathy and not present a, a tough facade that they don't feel that they can connect with. Um, so I think it's very much um, employee associate um, driven. Um, but I would also say um, that you're seeing it in the external um, marketplace too with, with clients and the types of um, focus that they want to see from leaders in company. They want CEOs of company making bold statements about what's happening in their communities and they don't want CEOs to be silent and they want them to have a voice and they wanna feel as they, they know these leaders. Um, so I, like many things, I don't think it's one thing or one silver bullet, um, but I personally am very pleased to see this shift. And does that affect, um, uh, one more question for you, Carol. Uh, yes. uh, uh, does that affect, so, so we talked a little about the C-suite, about 
uh, hiring practices, training, how you think of sort of cultivating the leadership generation of tomorrow? Yes, so I, I do. I see um, the training that, that we focus on, um, Kevin, within the company is not so much geared to where we might have been in years past, which is all around the technical skills. Of course, you need technical depth in various functions, and that's always important. I think that's that's table stakes. But where I see us leaning more into as, as a company is on those softer skills, right? How, how are people developing those leadership skills that for some, it might be more innate. Um, how do they make sure that they are developing very strong communication skills if they're not a natural collaborator, you know, how do we focus on, on building some of those new muscles in leaders? And, and we have seen a shift, at least in our training, um, that we focus on with, with all of our talent. And by the way, this is not just it for leaders. This is throughout the entire organization because it's important that that cascades through to anybody um, who might be just leading or managing a very small team of individuals. So a Angela, um, we've talked about we've talked about training. Um, you're at Columbia Business School. You're in the training business before they even get to uh, companies. Is this affected the way that the academy thinks about what is leadership and who are leaders of the future? Absolutely. So I think um, literally. So I teach two courses that are very relevant at the business school. One is called Driving Strategic Impact. So how do you be a strategic problem solver? And the other is called the Leader's Voice. And it's interesting um, how much of this stuff has changed, but it's also interesting when we do individual workshops with our students that are opt-in, when we call it something like empathetic leadership or inclusive leadership, the people that you would expect to attend that meeting attend. And a lot of the times people that we want to attend don't attend. So first we've had, we've done much more um, required training around things, but we've shifted the naming to be things like, how do you, how do you manage difficult conversations? How do you have cognitive flexibility? Now, how do you have difficult conversations? It's just code for inclusive leadership. And then cognitive flexibility is code for empathetic leadership, which is how do I put myself in the, in the position of our customer, of my employee, of my team member. Um, and it's sometimes I wish we didn't have to I don't want to say like disguise the topic, but there is the idea of like, you have to get people into the room when they're like, well, that's the soft and feely stuff that I don't need. And I would love to get to the point where we don't need to disguise it anymore, but we still do. But um, I think what happens is once they're in the room, they're like, this is incredibly useful, not just to me being a more in-touch leader, but it's going to help my bottom line, right? An example that I use in class, we talk about selling to pharmaceutical companies and empathetic leaders are better salespeople because they understand what the physician wants, what the nurse practitioner wants, what the payer wants, what the caregiver wants. It will make you a better business person. And I think it's so important that this isn't off on the side as soft, touchy, feely stuff that you only need to know um, if you're trying to manage a certain type of person, this is stuff that will help you in all business scenarios. So I think we're really trying to drive that message home in all of our curriculum. So Rick, uh, let me ask you the first question uh, from the audience, uh, which I think is an interesting one. Uh, comes from our good friend, anonymous attendee, uh, saying, how much can we attribute these conclusions to the glass cliff theory, with glass cliff, cliff in quotes, that people desire female leadership only in times of crisis? which we happen to be in one globally right now um, with the suggestion that perhaps this comes and goes depending upon the circumstances of what's happening in the world. What do you see? You're out there talking to American businesses all the time. What do you see about the sort of changing nature of leadership and whether this is a long-term trend or a product of very difficult circumstances right now? Well, Ken, thank you for having me. I certainly wouldn't attribute it to just a glass cliff theory, if you will. I think Caroline is absolutely right. There are a number of drivers uh, that has sort of gotten us to this place where we are now. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the issues that we've seen played out uh, across America, uh, the murder of George Floyd, the social unrest, uh, has created a different consciousness uh, that has moved uh, into the workforce where employees are demanding more uh, uh, accountability uh, when it comes to diversity and equity and inclusion, et cetera. Uh, you, you think about policymakers, I mean, you know, look at what happened in California uh, uh, with regards to board diversity in women. Uh, and so there are a number of factors, I think, uh, that are historic, uh, that are current, that are all attributing to, I guess, what we call these sort of modern day values that you described, that to front and center. And I think 
Uh, as well, I believe that the CEOs in the business community writ large really actually has a unique opportunity uh, to lead in a way perhaps that we've not been accustomed to lead uh, uh, around diversity and equality. You know, U.S. Chamber is, is stepping up its efforts uh, to advise, to guide the business community across America uh, to engage more directly on diversity and equality, not just because of the moral imperative, but the economic imperative. I mean, we all know the data. We saw it. We've seen the data. The case for diversity, whether it's ethnic, racial, or gender, it's just real that companies that are more diverse and inclusive are more profitable. Uh, our partnership with the Kellogg Foundation is a very fascinating one. Uh, you know, the, the Kellogg has done some extensive research that basically shows that if we address the inequality in America, that our GDP grows by $8 trillion. We can debate where there's eight, five, or six, but we're trying to make the business case uh, for uh, this work, uh, this consciousness, these new values, as opposed to just a moral case. So one other question, and this is ties into quite another question from the audience, which is, um, uh, um, we can see a lot of public conversation around um, uh, diversity and, and inclusion and the importance of it. Um, uh, uh, how, do, how do companies measure themselves? How do they know whether, how do they set goals in the space and how do we know whether they're being held accountable for making progress um, in this area? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I sort of look at this in, 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 from a different lens. Oftentimes we say, you know, how do we measure diversity? We measure by the numbers, how many women, how many uh, black uh, employees, how many, uh, 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 you know, Latinx, et cetera. And, and, I, and that's a really important measure uh, as we think about it because we can quantify that. But we also need to look at it in a vertical and horizontal way, not just frontline employees, but we got to think about board diversity uh, as well. We got to think about management and C-suite executives. And then the other thing I think is extremely important uh, as we think about the, the sort of in, internal facing environment, uh, you know, I also look at diversity in terms of our impact across society. Uh, you know, what are we really doing to impact the communities in which our companies exist? Uh, how do we think about uh, in, uh, bringing more women and minority businesses into our corporate supply chains? So I think all of that is, a, is sort of a collective uh, a lens in which I look at diversity uh, in, in, in driving not just outcomes for companies, but for our whole of society. So Angela, do you want to, you start yeah. leaning forward, it looks like you want to come in, please do. You know, part of the question of metrics was around actions. And I just wanted to share some tools. So I do a lot of uh, corporate training around diversity and inclusion, and I consult to Fortune 500 companies on the topic. And I, I love that you asked about them because there are a lot of tools out there that are helpful. So I'll just share a couple um, from a recruiting perspective to get more diversity into your pipeline. Matheson is one organization, um, M-A-T-H-I-S-O-N. And then if you want to make sure that your job description doesn't have bias, text T-E-X-T-I-O, Texio. They're a great tool where you can take your job description and put it in there and it will tell you if it's biased. Uh, so if you say, for example, I'm looking for a data ninja, a data rock star, a data guru, women and people of color are less likely to apply to that. But if you say, I'm looking for someone with three years of Tableau experience, then it's a much less biased way to do a job description. From a hiring perspective, if you want to blind yourself to the demographic information of who's applying, hire view, hire V-U-E, and Blendor, um, B-L-E-N-D-O-O-R, both do that. Um, and then I'll just share one around retention and promotion, which is really difficult, and I would argue the toughest part of the nut to crack. Uh, Fairy God Boss is like glass door for women. And um, women can go on there and say, how is this company around paternity, um, um, family leave policies, around flexible work, whatever the case may be. And it's specifically geared towards women. However, I would argue that companies who are good um, at that dimension, they tend to be good in terms of diversity in general. And that's Fairy God Boss. And you can look at your own company and be like, what do employees think about our policies around that? So Textio, Matheson, Hireview, Blendor, Fairy God Boss. I have hundreds, but those are the five that I thought I would share right now. Hey, Ken, the only thing that, that I'll add to, and, and it's about this glass cliff uh, theory. One of the things that I've seen, at, at least within Prudential, particularly as it relates to all the leadership and open forums we have with associates around all the racial inequity, um, the time has come to stop talking about it. And a lot of the sentiment is, how are we still talking about this? 
And so what I've seen is a complete shift in many companies that it is around holding leaders accountable for not still be talking about this a year from now, but what are the very um, transparent, communi broadly communicated uh, action plans and results that we expect to see. That's the level of expectation today. It's not about having the conversation. It's not about let's talk about this in a quarter from now. It is about holding ourselves accountable to all of our associates that we are serious about the change. We will be making change and hold us accountable for the results. And those are the types of conversations that I hear all the time, which is why I just don't think this is, they want a different type of leader and a different profile for the current time and challenging. This is here to stay. So, so Rick, go. may I just add, because I think Caroline touched on something I think is really important. That what I see across America, and, and you know, we represent some three million companies in state and local chambers, there is an interesting continuum of where people are on the issue. And, and not, it, but, but what's really fascinating is the reality that a lot of companies don't know how to have the conversation. And so I don't want to minimize the importance of that, even though we got to move from conversation to real action and sustainable action for the long term. Uh, a lot of people are asking the question even now, as we watch companies step up and make significant pledges, uh, statements and investments now, uh, because of the, the, the racial inequality, uh, George Floyd, et cetera, that, that we watch this play out. But I'm really struck, and I think it's important for us to recognize that companies and communities are at different levels of engagement around uh, advancing diversity, inclusion, and equality. For some, conversation is a really important starting point. We've been lead, we've done about 35 business roundtables uh, in just three states in helping some of these companies even begin to have dialogue. And I don't want to minimize it or the, the significance of at least starting. You, you can't win unless you get in the game. And for some folks, getting in the game is just trying to understand how, how, to, have, how to talk about race and gender inequality. Hey, look, I want to come. Uh, I want to follow up on, on that with you, Rick, because uh, I think it's a, it's a really important point. But uh, I want to give Joanna sort of a thirty-second notice that we're going to come back to her with uh, for her next set of slides. So, Rick, how, how do you, you're out there talking with companies of all different, call it sophistication, or all different generations on these issues and thinking about their leadership um, uh, leadership um, culture? Um, how how open are companies? Uh, to this notion of change and the change of the idea that 2020 is different than 2000 and different from 1980 and 2040 is going to be different as well. I'm finding that, that I'm finding that they're extraordinarily open, especially when you put this in the context, as I mentioned earlier, of the business and economic case, uh, why this really is important to your company and your industry and your sectors. I mean, you know, I was talking to a company that's sort of in the, in the new, new space economy. Uh, and materials and, you know, I don't know that they ever really thought about the need over the last 50 years to talk about race and inequality, but at least they're engaging now and starting to have this dialogue about how do we think about diversity because there isn't any diversity in our company. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's important. Uh, I, I think it's, it's easier you know, when you talk about it from the perspective of why this really matters to the growth the value proposition of your comp com company and if you really want to make a significant impact in our society, talk about from the business and economic lens. Great. Thank you, Rick. So uh, back to you, Joanna. But while you're getting set up, I just want to give a promo that um, Angela has put a number of links in the, in the chat uh, for some of the companies she just described. So if anyone's interested, they are there for your, for your use. All right. Uh, I have to say that um, I stare at numbers all day and it's, it's always really thrilling to share those numbers uh, with three brilliant people and watch them in conversation, <laughs> giving these numbers context. Um, so I'm excited for this next one because there's, there's a lot of data in this one. Um, so next up is kind of aging attitudes on the barriers uh, that women face. Uh, so last year we asked whether um, people thought a number of potential obstacles um, such as maternity leave uh, were detrimental um, to women looking to ascend in their workplace. We asked it again this year. Um, so in just one year, um, we saw a double digit jump um, on folks seeing issues at their own companies 
and within their own industries um, of, of women facing issues. Um, now, this is interesting because when you look at the 2019 data, people were really willing to say that society overall had these problems. You know, oh, society, they, you know, they, uh, there's sexual harassment going on out in the world. There's gender discrimination growing on, going on in the world. Um, but they weren't as willing to say the same about their companies um, and their industries um, that, that they were in. Um, that's no longer the case. Um, so majorities now attest that things uh, like sexual harassment, inflexible work hours um, are obstacles that women face um, at their company. This is uh, specifically within your own company, up from much smaller shares um, just in just September of 2019. So this is a different side that's going to look very similar. And that's kind of the point. Um, this is uh, within one's industry. So do you see these obstacles um, happening within your industry? So as you can see there, there's a double digit jump among most of them. Uh, majorities now recognize that women face these obstacles in their company, in their industry. Um, and here's that data when you look at society overall. Well, you'll notice not a lot of change um, compared to 2019 um, to now. Um, and that's mostly because uh, there was already pretty high recognition of society overall, uh, you know, having these issues. So I think one of my takeaways from this is that people are more cognizant of uh, issues in their own company and within their own industry. Um, there's also some disagreement about who has opportunities in the workplace and how many uh, they have for ascension, uh, for promotion. Um, and I look specifically uh, at women uh, of different races and ethnicities um, for this one. Uh, I wish I could have looked at more uh, race and gender breaks throughout the survey, um, but our sample size was 2000. Um, and there were times where the sample size was too small within each group. So this is one of those opportunities where I was able to, to look at smaller groups. So 35% of white women said that white men have too many opportunities. And that number is, is really dwarfed uh, by uh, the share of black, Hispanic and women of another race or ethnicity who responded. Uh, here's that uh, figure charted out with a few others. White women are also very unlikely to say that they themselves have too many opportunities. Uh, while well, women of color, black women, Hispanic, and, and women of other ethnicities, uh, they largely disagree with that notion. Indeed, fewer than half of white women say that racial and ethnic minorities have too few opportunities. Again, a number that's really dwarfed by non-white women. And again, here's that uh, number charted out with a couple more. And you'll see there's lots of red here, right? Red means that these, these folks, uh, they believe they have too few opportunities. Um, but it's worth looking at the right amount and the don't know figures, um, specifically among white women. So for example, white women are just as likely to say that women of color have the right amount of opportunities or say they're not her as they are to say that they have too few opportunities. I think that's a really, um, interesting data point to, to kind of settle on. Only three minutes, Ken. I hope I'm doing you proud. I'm loving the bite-sized data. I'm so happy right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, yes. And Joanna, just let me just ask you, um, for those who have uh, longer attention spans than my three minutes, um, where are you going to, where do you, you said it before, but where, where will people find this data uh, if they want to dive into it? Sorry, I was trying to find the unmute button. Um, it'll be available at morningconsult.com slash news. Um, if you want to, you can follow me on Twitter, but I warn you, I tweet a lot and I will be uh, tweeting out this presentation so you can take a look. Fantastic, thank you, Joanna. So Caroline, um, one of the things we talked about in actually in our prep session was your work with various affinity groups. Uh, that's, I think that's not the right term of art, but uh, forgive me for that. Business, but, uh, business resource groups. Business resource groups, yes. yes. Uh, uh, of different, uh, can you sort of describe, I thought it was really interesting, can you sort of describe your work with them and sort of, uh, and sort of to this, the sort of the, the data that Joanna was sharing there, what are yeah, some different yeah. questions uh, from, from- Yeah, ab absolutely. So I actually have the privilege kind of being able to be executive sponsor for a group that we call Women Empowered. And um, the women actually came up with that name and this is the business resource group for all women um, in the Prudential Enterprise. And I had pulled together um, a, a group of women 
from actually all of our business resource groups. So whether it was Juntos or Pride or NetVet or a Black Leadership Group, along with, with all the women from Women in Power, because they're part of that, that umbrella organization, just to really understand um, and, and make sure we're in tune with all the voices of women across Prudential and how are they feeling? How are they feeling right now in 2020 with the pandemic? How are they feeling about their careers and their career paths and some of their unique challenges? And, and I'll tell you, when, when I look at that, that um, data, Joanne, they, there are so many women that um, want to have this conversation. Um, they feel as though they do have some unique struggles in their career. And, and you think about even just what, what I'll call some perhaps unconscious bias, right? Everybody comes in to the workforce with their own set of experiences and their own lived experiences. And so almost set up a path for, well, this is what I think this person um, needs to have accomplished, or this is how I think this person should conduct themselves. And I think that plays out in, in really candidly, not the most constructive constructive ways. And I, you know, I, let's take women as an example. I think about some unconscious bias and how that leads to, to labeling and unfair labeling in, in many cases of women. So sometimes I think women get cast as they're too kind or they're too nice. Um, and I don't think that's it at all. I think um, the tendency for them to have empathy actually makes them far more effective in having to have tough conversations and make difficult, com difficult decisions, actually male or female, right? If you have that strong level of empathy, you're going to be more effective in seeing when things are wrong and picking up on it easily. Um, I've also heard women labeled as aggressive. You know, if you take the flip side and I'll challenge that and I'll say, is she aggressive? Because that has a negative connotation or is she assertive? And so I think it's this labeling and I could go on and on. Those are just a couple of examples. Um, but I, I do think um, that it's important that we look at those dimensions and that data and what it tells us for the opportunities for women. I, I think one of the things I would say um, for any leader in an organization is try to create those opportunities. When you look at that data and it shows that what less than one third of the people that responded felt as though women or women in co of color had enough opportunities to even reach senior levels. So what are we doing about that? Um, how are we understanding that data? Um, what are we doing to make sure that women and diverse candidates don't feel like they have to check off every single box because maybe they didn't have the opportunity to come through a specific career path. What do we do to create training or on the job opportunities to create those learnings that they need to be successful? So I think we need to be creative. So, so can I ask you sort of um, a, a lot of the questions I look at the Q&A. Um, yes. Thank you to everyone for, for putting these questions. There's sort of a bundle that are, what are the best practices in these areas? Um, what are, what are what is your company doing as a practical matter? I think, you know, Angela had some specific websites. I'm curious about sort of a leading company like Prudential. Well, it, was, it was interesting because Angela gave some great um, uh, tips for tools and resources. And, and one of the things that you mentioned was around even the, the job descriptions. We actually have gone in and uh, modified all of the job descriptions that we've had for postings. So it's not so prescribed that you had to have done this and then this and then this. Um, because you'll find, you know, many candidates, women and, and um, other diverse candidates may say, I didn't have those same opportunities. So how can we create the learnings or the avenue where they'll be just as successful, but they might not have be able to check off exactly the same boxes? That would be one example. Um, another one that I would say is being very deliberate for leaders around um, creating P&L. Um, opportunities for them to, to understand what it's like to run a business, whether it's more a, a, a you know, junior, second in command role. And so again, trying to be creative about those learned experiences on the job, I think is gonna be you know, absolutely critical. I also think the other thing is we do know through research, um, and again, this is specifically for women, they have a tendency to not even put their hat in the ring for an opportunity if they don't check off most of the boxes and they don't assume or don't have the same confidence to say, I'll just learn it on the job. And men have a tendency more to say, I can learn some of that um, on, in, on the job. So I think it's incumbent upon us to be more proactive in reaching out to high potential talent 
and letting them know you believe in them to take over an initiative or you believe in them to take over a new opportunity and role. And then you make sure that they've got the support necessary to succeed because I think that's where um, we can't underestimate that people are watching, like especially if they're more visible roles. So Rick, um, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, one of the insights that I'm so most eager to hear from you is you have this great sort of visibility into lots of different companies as you go out there and talk with them about um, uh, diversity inclusion and the, the, the economic and social benefits of it. Um, where do you see as sort of the big gaps in American business in the learning? Where are the unconscious biases or conscious biases um, that need to be changed in the future? Well, I think one of the areas is certainly in the sort of this executive leadership arena. I mean, you know, the reality is, you know, if you start at the top and the research bears it out, if you can deal with the executive leadership side of companies and organizations, sort of cascades down throughout the companies. You know, I was looking at a study uh, just a couple of days ago, Ken, uh, the, the state of uh, black women in corporate America. Uh, and this particular report shows that only 1.3% of executives and uh, executive level managers or above are black women of color. And when you think about it, there's there, there are none. There are no black women who are leading Fortune 500 companies. Uh, I think Ursula Burns, uh, obviously we know very well that her leadership is Xerox. And I believe Mary Winston, who was the interim CEO uh, for a while at uh, Bed Bath and Beyond. But, but that should be very telling uh, when we think about how we gauge and look to put metrics in place and the work that's yet to be done. Uh, because if that's the pinnacle and that is the break in the glass ceiling to be a Fortune 500 CEO, we got a lot of work to do. And so, you know, I, again, I think at the executive level, uh, and that includes boards, uh, uh, a, a corporate boards, is a place where we need to do a lot of work. And I think, again, if we can fix some of that, uh, we can begin to model that same uh, leadership down through the organizations. So, Angela, um, in some ways, uh, leadership uh, and the culture of leadership and who gets the lead starts earlier than, than the front door of the company, often starts in business school or colleges and um, uh, other institutions. How do you think, at, at Columbia Business School, how do you think about sort of how do you get the next generation of leaders ready uh, and ensuring that they're ready for a different yeah. leadership culture? So I'll kind of share two uh, tactical things that I share in every corporate training or every class that I teach and we do in orientation at Columbia. So um, there are a lot of biases that we have to watch out for. Two that um, Caroline was speaking to quite a bit. Uh, one is potential versus performance. So straight white men um, are promoted based off of potential and all other um, groups are promoted based off of performance, right? And so you'll often hear like, you know, he's ready for this opportunity versus like, oh, well, she hasn't done that before. Um, and so knowing that, uh, a couple things, again, we talked about job descriptions and writing it so that, again, the data shows that women are only going to apply to a job if they check off all the boxes, whereas men are more likely to apply to a job that they check off like six of the 10 boxes. So how do you write your job description in a way that doesn't scare away people who have a very high internal bar for imposter syndrome? And the other thing I always tell everybody personally is to have a nudge buddy. Um, and what I mean by that is somebody who just like pushes you to do the thing that you don't feel like you're ready for. Um, I have been lucky enough to have a couple of them for over a decade. And it used to be we would meet like once a month. We're probably down to every three to six months now, honestly, because we're, you know, getting busier. But it's just like having someone just be like, you said, you know, three years ago that you wanted to write a book. Why haven't you written it yet? Or whatever that thing is. But like pushing people both in really little ways, but in really big ways as well. Like, are you speaking up once in every single meeting? Whatever that is. But having that just like we have running buddies. So that's one. Um, and then the other thing is that um, women and people of color are often dealt, they deal with the tightrope effect, right? Which is that if you don't behave within the way that you are perceived to be supposed to behave, you're penalized for it. So if you're too loud, you're strident, you're the B word. Um, if you're too quiet, you're completely invisible. And so people have to walk a tightrope where they can't be too one way or the other. And so two things that I always tell people to do like as kind of personal exercises is one is, you know, the three V's. If you think about how we communicate, it's broken up into verbal, vocal, and visual. Verbal, the words that I'm using. Vocal, do I sound confident? Am I talking too quickly? Probably. And then visual, do I look the part? 
and find five people that you feel really close to and just say like, look, I want to break down these three things. What's, what are one or two things that I can do to help me better achieve my role? And that might be, I want to dial up my power or maybe I want to dial down my harshness, whatever it is, whatever feedback you've gotten, like ask people who know you well for those things that you can do every day to um, lean into whatever role it is that you want. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that the data shows that warmth and power temper each other. So if you are somebody who has is very strong and have gotten the feedback that you're strident, aggressive, well, then you want to temper it with warmth. Um, and so that's one thing that you can do where you can be just as strong as you are, but if you add some warmth to it, then you can use those strong words and be uh, like talking a lot in meetings, but people will be more willing to listen to the things. And I'm not saying that you should assimilate in any sort of way, but it is around knowing how these little things that we do every day, how they land on people and how that will lead to how people perceive you. So uh, I'm going to ask you a, 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 another question, Angela, and then sort of put it out as a jump ball to, to both Caroline and Rick if they're interested in addressing as well. And then we'll go to Joanna. So this is your uh, your, your, your warning uh, for the for your data on COVID and, and women. So um, there was a question from the audience about uh, diversity training, cultural diversity training, and the value of it. Um, and it reminded me of that the Trump administration, uh, not to make this about politics, uh, that's not the, the point, um, uh, had actually issued an executive order or, or policy recommendation to the agencies to stop doing any diversity training or cultural diversity training. Um, yeah. and, and I think my question actually is not about the Trump administration, um, but about there are people out there who I think uh, benefited from the current way of promotion and and and, and the current ecosystem is succeeded for it, believe in it, um, don't necessarily want it to change. How do you convince entre entrenched interests that things like yeah. uh, cultural diversity training is important? I, I usually do two things. The first thing is I tell everyone to take the test I just put into the chat room. It's the implicit association test. And you take a little quiz and it Basically what it tells you is that everyone has bias. I do training on diversity and inclusion and a lot of that is around female inclusion. I am biased and this test when I took it showed that I think that women are more correlated with home making and warmth. And I think that men are more correlated with power and working and income. And I do diversity training, yet I have that bias because when I was a kid, I watched the Jetsons and George Flintstones and I watched Barney and Fred go off to the quarry, right? Like that's why I have that in my brain. So step one is I make everyone in the organization take that test. And I'm like, I promise you there's bias. And then the second is I show them data around why this is both the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do, right? Rick talked a lot about this. There's so much incontrovertible evidence at this point that this is good for business. LPs, right? I, I work in venture capital. LPs are forcing, are asking for fund managers to be investing in diverse companies. So if I can't convince them this is the right, the, the right thing to do, at least I can convince them that it's a smart thing to do using data. Actually, I'll take your jump ball offer here, Ken, and just pile on to that. Um, I actually think um, Angela's spot on on that last point. I, I think it is creating the business case. There is so much data. There are so many research studies um, that, that truly show um, this is about the best possible thing for the business. And in terms of what I guess you're referring to as a zero sum game, because you're promoting more women, um, you're promoting um, more people of color into leadership roles, are people going to lean into that? Because that does, does that mean um, if you're a white male, you're not gonna get as many opportunities. So it's a zero sum game. And there's also a, a lot of research done on that, that that's absolutely not what happens at all. Um, it, all boats rise because the business winds up doing better. There's more diverse leadership teams. Um, people are actually more engaged um, more happy, um, generally speaking, in the, in the workplace. So I think that's important. I think it's education on this does not have to be a zero-sum game. There's no evidence that it has been. And I think that is a really important point for us to provide education and awareness on within companies. Ken, yeah, not a jump ball, but just to tip it in. <laughs> Caroline just said, you, you, you cannot look at this as a zero-sum game. And when you think about and sadly, the construct for some people who are entrenched 
and don't want to advance this construct of diversity, inclusion, and the value proposition of it, I think they're still stuck in looking at this as a zero sum game. And if you think about it, uh, and we actually oppose, uh, not for the politics, that executive order at the US Chamber. And if you think about it, if it makes sense in business, why wouldn't it make sense in government? I mean, I've run a federal agency and a state agency, and it's all about a more inclusive environment, uh, your ability to, to reach your customers, i.e. the people in America who you serve. So the, the, the thesis is the same, that diversity, equity, and inclusion matters, and it's good for business, whether you are in the business of government or in the business of business. So I just want to make that point that, I mean, we, we have to push back on uh, these efforts to uh, uh, not embrace uh, the concept of diversity, equity, inclusion, no matter what we are. Thank you all three for that. Uh, Joanna, um, excited to see your, your data on coronavirus. On COVID, all right. So we couldn't really talk about leadership um, in professionals this year without talking about COVID, right? Um, while working remotely, kind of the challenges that come with that are certainly interesting and something that leaders have had to kind of balance during the pandemic. I wanted to focus a little bit more um, about parents and caregiving uh, during this time. So here's one stat that really stood out to me in our survey uh, during the section, you know, when we talked about COVID, men are twice as likely as women to say that CEOs are spending too much time helping parents balance family and work during the pandemic. Um, so here's that figure kind of charted out with a couple more. And there are, uh, there are some similar proportions here when we asked about navigating the pandemic overall, 18% of men said that CEOs were doing too much um, and only 10% of women said CEOs were uh, doing too much to navigate the pandemic. And you'll also notice that although this is the COVID section, uh, one of the things that really defined this summer uh, were the racial injustice protests. And we had a couple questions um, in the survey on that. Um, there's even more in the crosstabs. That, again, I, explore, I um, encourage you guys to explore those as well. But there's a similar um, proportion there that men think that uh, CEOs were doing too much to respond um, to the protests that erupted over um, the killing of George Floyd. Uh, women who identify as Black, Hispanic, Asian, or another race or ethnicity were more likely to say that they're spending more time helping their child uh, with schoolwork uh, than white women were. And women overall were more uh, likely to say that they're spending more, not less, time on domestic duties uh, during the pandemic. And we all know that, uh, you know, according to the Census Bureau, the um, the time spent survey that they do every year, uh, women are much more likely to be doing these domestic chores in the first place uh, more than men. Uh, we're getting closer to, to equal share, but uh, still not near that in terms of domestic duties at home. I'd also like to point out that uh, women were slightly more likely to say that they're spending less time on work related to their job. That's that kind of last bar on the bottom there. And there's also some disagreement about what COVID will do for professional women uh, moving forward. I think this is maybe one of the biggest questions that, that I would love answered um, in this panel. Um, men have kind of a rosier outlook on the pandemic and what it will do for women in their careers than, than women do. Um, and this is just one of those data points that it's a very complicated question, right? It's just really messy. Um, there's so much to kind of pull at here. Um, and it's why I wanted to end the presentation on this. Uh, what will COVID do uh, for women's ascension? What will, um, will it set us forward? Will it set us back? Is it, is it a mixed bag? Is it not as straightforward as that? You can see that there's no gender differences on the issue of uh, the acceptance of remote work and what that will do. You know, this is one of those data points I just stared at and I couldn't make sense of. Um, so I'd, I'd really love people's thoughts on that. Great, so we'll actually ask, uh, I'm actually ask Angela a question, um, uh, um, a specific question, and then uh, I think we can do exactly as you said, Joanna, put it out there. What, what do people make of that? Um, so I think that's a sort of interesting piece of data. But Angela, in our 
um, prep session, you actually said something, you said lots of interesting things, but one of the things you talked about is the challenge of COVID-19 to women entrepreneurs. Um, yeah. Um, so what happens in general when things are tough, if you think about like Maslow's hierarchies of need, which we all learned about in psychology, um, you need to first think about, you know, like shelter and food, and then you can think about all the way up to self-actualization. And thinking about diversity tends to be, for a lot of people, it feels like a nice to have. And so when things are tough, it kind of goes out the window because you're trying to pay rent, you're trying to pay, make payroll, whatever the case may be. Um, and so the uh, COVID has been disproportionately worse for underrepresented founders. Um, and part of it is because people are, th were thinking less about diversity, maybe in like m March and April, because they were thinking about, again, making payroll. Um, and then the second reason is because so much of both venture relationships, but just business relationships in general are based off of in-person networking. And it's hard to do that when you're talking over Zoom all day long. And so how do you network in the age of COVID? And so we, some of the things that we talk about when working with our female founders is exactly that question, right? How do you reach out to new people versus just having people fund the same people? And then um, Salon did a really interesting, salon.com did a really interesting article maybe like two weeks ago where they did show that the pandemic has been much worse for women. Um, I'm just looking at a study right here. It says that 26% uh, of men surveyed um, received like a pay raise, whereas only 13%. Um, and basically it's a very depressing article about how the last six months the pay gap has increased between women and men because of COVID. So it's not a particularly happy article. So, so Rick, um, uh, thank you, Angela. Um, Rick, what do you see as the fallout of the pandemic for um, women and diversity efforts? Um, and let me ask you both the good and bad, since I suspect there'll be both. Well, listen, on the bad side, you know, we did a study uh, uh, with MetLife where we surveyed small businesses across the country. And we did one recently, particularly focused on black and minority businesses and found that some 66% as a result of the pandemic are concerned about permanently closing. That is a big number, Ken. And, you know, and a lot of those businesses are led by women uh, of color. And, you know, we were, we were talking earlier in prep about child care. Uh, it's not just child care in terms of the, the provision of child care services to frontline workers who were disproportionately being impacted by COVID-19, but a lot of the daycare and child care centers are owned by women of color. And so there's a whole linear sort of, of impact here on, on the impact of COVID-19. You know, I, it, it, as I've been talking to black and minority business across the country, when you, if there is a good side, and there has to be a good side because there's another side to the COVID pandemic, is to start reimagining uh, who we are as black enterprises in America. You know, this is a time to, to, to think about restructuring your companies and joint ventures and, you know, mergers and acquisitions and, uh, and what are the emerging economies and businesses that will come out as a result of COVID-19. The last point I'll make is, you know, it's so fascinating and I'm so fascinated with Jonah's data uh, regarding these new modern day values like empathy and being open-minded and fair and positive, you know, and how do you convey that in this world of Zoom and on Microsoft Teams? And, and so it's really fascinating, and which I think it is, as you think about women leading forward, uh, those are the attributes we need more now than ever. Empathy, all of those attributes that are, are very positive uh, when you look at her results. So I'm, a, I'm the ultimate optimist. I think the path is bright for women. Uh, if we give them a chance uh, and provide the opportunity for, for them to lead. Uh, those virtues are more needed now than ever uh, that, that, that Jonah talked about in her survey. So, so Karen, thank, thank you, Rick. Rick um, Karen, let me ask you about that. Uh, I mean, are these um, attributes of empathy, open-mindedness um, that we do attribute with women, the majority of people attribute with women, more important now and into the future? And do you see that as a good outcome of, of, of out of many yes. bad of, of, of this year? So I'm, I'm smiling, Rick. I, I share your optimism. I am a glass half full person. Um, yes, I think those um, traits are more important than ever before. Um, but I also think it is going to carry us forward in terms of leadership for the future. I mentioned briefly, Ken, because you asked, why did I first pull all those women together? And um, just to reiterate, it was because I was concerned. 
when I see the data that says two months ago, 80% of the 1.1 million people who decided to drop out of the workforce were women. Um, when you see, and Angela, you quoted it, the, the men, percent of men receiving promotions versus women or pay raises during this time, there's a quantum gap there. And if we're not paying attention to it, we're all going to wake up really surprised to say we did take steps backward. And oh my goodness, how did this happen? We had too many um, incredibly talented individuals leave the workforce. Um, with that two-month exodus, um, women of color left in droves in a disproportionate level. And so how do we have the conversations now to let women know with the right degree of empathy and listening and understanding so that we understand what they're dealing with every single day? Because very often there are very simple things that we can do to change company policies. It could be a change in human resources. It could be additional support to be able to provide some tutoring uh, money because they find themselves as a tutor and also trying to manage a job and they've got middle school kids at home. Um, we could provide more support in terms of mental health and stress because that's also elevated for women. And so how, how do we be, um, and we said this before, how do we have the right action steps that we can take and we can take them with a sense of urgency so we don't wind up a year from now saying, what happened? How did we lose so much ground? Um, and nobody's intending to lose ground, but unfortunately sometimes it happens. So what would you say, I'm gonna actually ask this uh, as sort of a final question for everyone. Um, what is the one thing you would say to that 24% of men and 12% of women who think CEOs are doing too much um, to recognize the sort of the challenge that women and families are facing during the pandemic? What would you say to them to change minds? I, I, well, I'll, I'll jump in first. I would, I would absolutely say there, there's, there's no, no possible way we can be spending too much time on what people are experiencing with the balance that they have in their lives right now, because that is the reality that we find ourselves in. You have most kids not in school or in school some days and out of school some days. That's just the reality we find ourselves in, and we can bury our head in the sands and hope it will go away, or we can be in tune with our associates and we can pay attention. Um, to where they are here, and so I don't think um, I don't I don't think there's any um, attention or any less attention should that should be paid for this. And actually, I think we should be paying more attention to it. Rick, do, oh, I'm sorry, Angela. You, were, I see you formulate. Yes, didn't matter which order you go in. Uh, I see you formulating. So uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I I think again I I like data, and I think I would just show them the very simple math exercises of the cost of employee retention, right, versus the cost of childcare, and then the cost of loss of worker productivity and the cost of childcare, and the math is very easy to do. Fantastic. Rick, you get the final word before we turn it over to Matthew Quint for, uh, for the exit. My, my final word is ditto to Carolyn and to Angela. <laughs> Rick Wade and I approve those messages. That's it. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Thank you all for this, uh, all four of you, for this wonderful conversation. Um, uh, my colleague, Matthew Quint, has now appeared on the screen uh, uh, to, 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 to take us away. Thank you, Matt. Thank you all for joining us today. Excellent. Thanks, Ken. Let me uh, have everyone in the audience, right, the virtual round of applause for Ken and Joanna and Angela and Rick and Caroline. Uh, great discussion. Uh, I got to dive into some of the survey work uh, with Morning Consult, and uh, I look forward to uh, there's some more cross tabs and things we hope to uh, continue to put out. Uh, out of that survey. Uh, and there'll be more to come. Uh, go to ascendcommitment.com. Uh, for more information about uh, this project, uh, how it moves forward, future events, eventually the video, obviously, of this panel discussion will be up there. Um, at the Center on Global Brand Leadership at the Business School, you know, we focus on what it takes to build a strong brand and view that from these very, all the parts of an organization that build relationships with all its stakeholders. So diversity and inclusion uh, and leadership are huge parts of what building a strong brand is both inside and outside an organization. I love the focus today on what can we do constructively. Uh, there's other research coming out of other colleagues at Columbia Business School, um, Vanessa Burbano and Nicholas Padilla and Stefan Meyer. So a management, marketing and finance professor have a study out this year looking at 
sort of how, you know, confirming what many people would think of instinctively, which is women uh, favor more purpose in work, meaning and doing work that's meaningful for society. They're roughly the same as men in, in all other categories in terms of uh, compassion, uh, in terms of compensation and all those others have similar desires. But there's that difference there. There's this trade off in the meaning. So hopefully, some of the things that were beginning to take place in 2019, the business roundtable statement on, on moving beyond shareholder purpose into stakeholder purpose, uh, continue to move forward. I think that will help drive greater interest uh, for some of these diversity inclusion issues uh, on that you know, desire side of coming into certain roles and positions uh, that may have been trade-offs in the past. Um, and then another one of our colleagues, Mabel Abraham, uh, has some great research about the the challenges around, you know, bias against uh, females being often in large data sets. It's when you're when you're diverse from the situation is where the bias takes even stronger hold than when you're closely connected uh, to a situation. Um, from a timeliness perspective or from a numbers of people you're considering. So that gets into this, one of her suggestions as we were talking about talent management. You know, if you can narrow down your pool of candidates you're thinking about, it can help remove some of that bias to lean towards potentially more male sounding names or, or male applicants to positions. So um, thank you again, everyone. Uh, can't wait for more discussion on this and uh, I wish everyone a great rest of their Monday. Thanks all.